listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. My name is Hannah, and thank you so much for joining me today. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. If you're interested in journaling, if you've been journaling for a while or you're new to journaling and you've been thinking, you know, I I really want to try that. I wonder what that's all about. Then you might be interested in my ebook, which is called The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. And that's available now through becomingwhoyouare.net. And it's available through Amazon for Kindle as well. Smashwords as a PDF and other formats and directly through my website as a beautifully narrated audiobook. So the book contains pretty much everything you need to know about journaling. It covers practical things like tools you can use, uh, best time of day to journal, how often you should journal, how to deal with resistance to journaling, how to make the most out of your journaling practice. And it also contains over a hundred different suggestions and prompts that you can use to kickstart your journaling practice. Journaling is really a wonderful personal development tool. I've gotten a huge amount out of it myself, and I've learned a huge amount through my experience over the past six or seven years with my own journaling practice. So I really hope that you check the book out and make the most of this really important personal development tool. Today on the podcast, I wanted to talk about the idea of becoming your own consultant. And this is an idea I got from a man called Harry Brown, who has written many books, and one of which perhaps is most famous is called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. And in this book, Harry describes a time when he decided to get out of debt. And this is what he writes. At the time I was doing miscellaneous sales jobs for several different companies, I went to the manager of one of the companies and asked him what his worst problem was. What he told me was something I couldn't do anything about, so I asked him what his second worst problem was. In reply, he explained the difficulty he was having because various administrative personnel weren't supporting the company's sales programs. I offered to give them a series of sales lectures and he accepted the offer. I created a lecture series together with an incentive system that would reward the administrative personnel for their sales help. I remember the incident well because the day before I saw the manager, I was sulking in my living room saying to myself, there's nothing I can do. There's always something you can do. And usually the way to find out what you can do is to ask. What I really like about this section is that it highlights something that I think is a very human thought pattern to get into, which is this feeling of despair, that there's nothing that we can do to get out of this situation, and really wanting to change something, but not being able to see our way out of it. And what I especially appreciated about it was the fact that Harry shows how he himself had been in that position just the day before. He'd been sitting in his living room thinking, I'm really in debt, and I don't know how to get out of it. And then the next day, He was talking to this manager and he saw that opportunity, he saw that window where not only could he help himself and help himself get out of debt, but he could do that by helping someone else too. As well as being an ingenious business idea, this idea that there's always something you can do and usually the way to find out what you can do is to ask raises an interesting question. Because for me, it makes me ask, why can't we be consultants to ourselves? After all, we know ourselves better than anyone. We know what our problems are, and with a little perspective, we know what the best solutions are too. And quite often, we get stuck in these thought patterns I described earlier, but really, all we need to do is take a step back and look at the bigger picture. What would happen if we became our own consultants? What would happen if we could sit down with ourselves and imagine that we were in a professional consultation situation and say, okay, what is my biggest problem right now? And I wonder for you, what would the answer be to that question? I wonder if you could take a couple of seconds now just to think about it and think, if I am being my own consultant, What is the biggest problem that I am facing right now? What is weighing on my mind the most? What is taking up most of my mental energy, my emotional energy, my headspace? And what ultimately is distracting me from going out and doing the things that I want to do, being the best version of myself that I can realistically be? What what is weighing me down at the moment? 
And this might be an internal conflict. It might be an external situation. But if you can, I would really like you just to take a few seconds, maybe 10 or 20 seconds, just to think about this right now. Once we've identified this problem, there are five steps that we can take to help ourselves overcome it. The first step is to break the problem down. So chances are this isn't a simple problem, otherwise you would have rectified it already. So there might be many, many things stopping you from um, overcoming the problem. Um, we'll take a look at these in, a, in step four, which is coming up. But right now, quite often it can help you get perspective on a problem if you just break it down. So step by step, what is the issue here? The second step is to identify which factors you have control over and which you don't. And the really important thing with this is to be objective. So quite often for everyone, it might feel like you have no control over some aspects of the problem when actually you do. This is something that I've talked about on the blog quite a lot before, where quite often we refer to things that we have to do and things that we need to do when actually what they are, if we're going to be honest, is things that we're choosing to do. So we talk about obligations we have in our everyday lives, which are completely chosen and we have the choice not to do them. But the way we talk about them, the way we think about them is, oh, these are things that I have to do. And quite often that's, that really weighs us down. That's quite a demotivating way of looking at it. And it really limits our sense of freedom in our own lives. So the the really important thing with this step, like I said, is to be objective and try every, every step of the way to question yourself and say, okay, I don't feel like I have any control over this factor. Is that really true? Do I have any semblance of control whatsoever? You might find that the answer surprises you. Equally, at the same time, on the other end of the scale, you might be taking too much responsibility for some things that you can't change. So for example, uh, quite a common thing that we all try and change that we can't change is other people and their behavior and things that they do and things that they say. And this is not something that we can change. Um, it's actually unfair on ourselves and unfair on the other person to try and do that. So have a look and see what you might be taking responsibility for that actually you don't have any control over. Step three is to list ways you've already tried to tackle the things you have control over. This suggestion involves listing all the things that you've tried so far. So this might involve conversations that you've had to try and rectify the problem, uh, practical steps you've taken, perhaps taking on more commitments or giving up some commitments. Perhaps you've taken this issue to therapy or coaching. Perhaps you've talked to a friend or a relative about it. Perhaps you've journaled about it. So just list everything that you've tried so far um, to tackle the things that you have control over. So we're not talking about the things that you've identified that you don't have control over here. These are just the things that you have control over. When we have this list and we can see what hasn't worked, we're in a much better position to accept and acknowledge that we might have to get a bit creative to solve the problem. And this is a really important step because trying to solve a problem with the same solutions that don't work it is only frustrating and time consuming. There's a famous quote about this by Albert Einstein, which says, insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. When we look at this list, we can see all the things that we've tried that haven't worked, not necessarily because they're not valuable things for us to do, but perhaps because we haven't approached them in the right way or we haven't prepared enough for them or we've been going into them with a very specific mindset which has generated a specific outcome. Having this list will help you take a good, again, objective look at what you've been doing so far and help you take a step back and see, okay, this hasn't been working, so what else can I do to try to solve this issue? Step number four is list the solutions that you haven't tried yet and why you haven't tried them. These reasons might be practical or emotional. Often we invent practical reasons to cover the emotional ones. Um, for instance, let's say I've just qualified as a vet and I want to open my own practice. I can tell myself that I need a certain amount of funding to do so, need contacts in the industry, need uh, 10 years experience behind me or however much before I can possibly dare to go it alone. 
In fact, I could probably stay up all night finding reasons why it wouldn't be a good idea for at least another 10 years. And those practical reasons might have some weight, so they might be um, true. However, they are not the real reason why I wouldn't be able to go and set up my own vet practice, for example. The real reason would be that I'm afraid. And again, I think this is a really common thought pattern that we get into when we are scared of something we justify our feelings with all these reasons why it could never happen and quite often we say I can't when what we really mean is I'm scared. That's just one example of how practical reasons can be used as a cover for emotional reasons. So my challenge to you is to think about all the solutions that you haven't tried yet and really look at the emotional root of why you haven't tried them. What is what is un, what is really underneath that resistance because the vast majority of times when we look at a situation that we would like to change and we see all these practical barriers to doing so, those practical barriers are not the problem. What is really the problem is the emotional barriers underneath. Because when we feel something like fear or we feel anxious about something, our brain will fill in the gaps and it will find reasons to justify that feeling. In the example of the, the vet practice that I hypothetically want to start in the future, I will feel nervous about doing it. I, you know, I, there'll be lots of other feelings as well. Like I might feel excitement, I might feel some trepidation, uh, I might feel some joy about being able to do what I love. But there will also be some really uncomfortable feelings in there like fear and nervousness. What my brain does is it wants to alleviate those feelings because they're uncomfortable, they don't feel very pleasant. So it finds all these reasons why I cannot start my vet practice right now. And if I can't start my vet practice, then... There's no reason to feel fear about starting it because it's not something that I can do now anyway. When you're looking at solutions that you haven't tried yet, really look at why you haven't tried them and try to be as brutally honest with yourself as possible. It's not a particularly comfortable exercise, but it will help you get to the root of why you've become so stuck in this particular issue and perhaps even why this issue has occurred in the first place. Step number five is look for the story behind the reasons. So as I mentioned before, all of the practical reasons that I gave for starting my own vet practice can be overcome. What's really behind all of them is the emotional stuff, so namely fear, or more specifically, a fear of failure or even of success. That's the taboo fear that not a lot of people talk about but is very relevant and might be something that I'll do a podcast on in the future. When we look at most problems we encounter, usually the emotion that prevents us from reaching the obvious solution is fear. Fear of failure, fear of success, fear of judgment from others and ourselves, fear of things changing, fear of annoying people, fear of damaging relationships, fear of changing dynamics in relationships. The list goes on and on. There's many, many different types of fear that we could feel and all for very good reasons as well. And once we've identified this fear, we can ask ourselves the question, if fear of, insert fear here, wasn't an issue, what would I do to overcome this problem? So if my fear of financial instability wasn't an issue, what would I do to overcome the problem? If my fear of changing my relationships wasn't the issue, what would I do to overcome the problem? If my, if my fear of failure or my fear of success wasn't an issue, what would I be doing right now to change or to solve or overcome this problem? And that is your answer. I'd really like you to take some time today and think, what is my biggest problem right now? What is taking up most of my energy? And to use these five steps to walk yourself through it and to be your own consultant. Because taking a step back and using this kind of framework and viewing it like a consultancy, like you're offering yourself a service or advice, can help get you out of those really stuck thought patterns. I'd really like to hear what your experience of this is and how you get on with it as well. So please get in touch and let me know. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.